take an inside look at how the city's code enforcement officers are working to address vacant and neglected properties in Louisville. A local museum highlights the history of the Louisville Water Company and find out how two artists collaborated to create a new ballet, next on Metro Edition. Hi everyone, this is Metro Edition. I'm Matt Schuster. Vacant and neglected properties affect our neighborhoods and quality of life. For Metro Council members working to identify and bring exposure to the top property owners who have neglected properties and code enforcement officers on the street, Metro government is working to address the issue. Here's an inside look at the role that a code enforcement officer plays. Code enforcement. Debbie Cecil, I'm a code enforcement supervisor for the property maintenance division at Codes and Regulation. We enforce housing code violations in the Section 8 inspections as well as environmental issues. There's 39 areas at this time uh, and there's 39 inspectors, so each inspector has an area that they're assigned to go to every day. Trying to keep the air from becoming blighted. Uh, trying to make sure that the neighborhood is uh, being safe, the properties are able to be rented out or sold, uh, to get rid of as many vacant properties as we can that are not being taken care of, uh, with the understanding that rental property goes vacant occasionally, but not typically for long periods of time. We're more concerned about the ones that stay vacant for long periods of time and no repairs are being made. Uh, the inspector gets to their car, they pull up their computer, all their work is in the computer, they route themselves for the day. Then they go to whatever area or street it is that they've routed themselves to. Uh, and through that, they see if it's a complaint, a reinspection, or for what reason th that it is in their computer. When they get to the property, they do a complete exterior inspection, whether it's vacant, a vacant lot, vacant structure, or an occupied house or commercial. Typically, they come out because of a complaint. Uh, they'll address what the complaint is. If they find that the complaint is not correct, maybe the person's already taken care of the problem or they got the wrong address when, they, when it was called into Metrica, uh, the inspector at that point just does a complete inspection. Whether the violation exists that they were calling in about or not, it's still a complete inspection. We inspect the exterior of the home if no one's home be it if it's occupied. If no one's home, we'll leave a card on the door and then we'll do an exterior inspection. Typically we're looking at high weeds and rubbish, uh, anything on the structure, gutters, downspouts, siding, windows, uh, you name it, if it's on the exterior of the house, we're going to look at it along with fencing, trees, uh, rubbish, uh, the sidewalks leading up to the front door, the doors. So we came into this area and found that there was a lot of high weeds, vacant structures that were laying open with rubbish everywhere, along with some residential property, be it, be it vacant or tenant or owner occupied. Uh, and through that process of siting and getting the owners to take care of it, and then the ones that owners didn't take care of the city cutting and cleaning it and billing the owners, the other people who were living here all have started taking care of cutting their grass and cleaning it up and even doing some minor repairs such as painting and gutter repairs and roof repairs. Uh, typically we cite the violations, we notify the owner of record, uh, even though we can't find them, we try to notify them from what the PVA records show us. And then at that point, if the violation isn't corrected, we start putting citations on it. After so many citations, then we refer it to our uh, foreclosure. On a vacant property, that means that we're able to get hold of an individual uh, or they're making some kind of repairs uh, or some to that effect. An abandoned property is it's obvious that the house is not being taken care of and we can't find the owner of that property. That's what we consider an abandoned property. Well, it will keep crime, help with the crime instead of the house being used for people to go in and sleep in or sell drugs out of or whatever type of illegal activity that they're doing, 
it prevents some of that as well. The reason we came out to this area was the police department was having a problem with a lot of vacant properties and uh, uh, crime going on at the vacant properties. And we have pretty much eliminate that whenever you cut the grass down and you secure up the buildings. They would call Metrocall at 574-5000 or 311. Due to the number of typhoid and cholera cases caused by unsafe drinking water in the mid-1800s, Louisville was known as the Graveyard of the West. That's what led to the Louisville Water Company being created, which opened its first pumping station in 1860. It was pure when people first got here, but as soon as people settled, they started to mess it up, which is what people do if they run unchecked. And by 1861, it was something that you drank at your own risk. That's what led to the creation of the Louisville Water Company, which opened its first pump station in 1860. By 1912 to 1915, the incidence of cholera and typhoid uh, significantly reduced. So the, the basic steps were sedimentation, followed by coagulation, filtration, and then chlorination. And all those processes that are standard today were developed here in Louisville, Kentucky. And this year, it's celebrating 150 years of history and innovations. And the Louisville Water Company has a great reputation throughout the nation uh, as being one of the most professionally operated and managed utilities in, uh, in the world. Now you can learn about interesting facts and historical information at the Fraser International History Museum's Waterworks exhibit. This was a sort of a pioneer city as far as clean water went and it meant a great deal at the time. You can get an inside look at the water company from when it was first established to how it grew to be one of the most innovative of its kind. The original system had 26 miles of water main and 512 customers. Now, the Louisville Water Company maintains more than 4,100 miles of pipe and serves about 780,000 people. The system only covered this small area. Today, we now have uh, piping and service within three counties, which is primarily Jefferson County, Bullock County to the south, and then Oldham County to the northeast. A replica of the water tower, an early fire truck, and contrast of an old and new lab are great visual teachers. So it's a great opportunity to be able to, to take those snapshots in time and put yourself in that context of an opportunity to be able to see how water works for Louisville every day. Photos, interactive exhibits, and videos all help tell the stories and keep visitors engaged seeing it tested and, and seeing what that looks like uh, when it gets analyzed under a microscope and things like that. That's sort of part of the fun of this whole thing. We, we're trying to have a good commitment to showing people how things were over time so that it's more interesting experience and they can sort of explore it for themselves. We don't have to keep telling people. They can look and find out and touch and feel. Excerpts from renowned engineers like Charles Hermony and George Warren Fuller, who pioneer water filtration techniques, line the walls. We've had a number of amazing individuals that have come through the Louisville Water Company. We have such a rich history of building infrastructure that will last. And more modern groundbreaking technology like the Riverbank Filtration Project is described. In that process, a hole is dug very deep below the surface to a water source, and then the earth purifies the water as it's pumped through layers of clay and sediment. That treatment process produces water of similar, similar quality as what we produce when we go through our entire treatment process, with the exception of adding a chemical disinfectant. So it's a pretty effective green, natural uh, treatment process. In 2008, Louisville's water was named the best tasting tap water in the country by American Water Works Association. The impact that a good water supply has on just how healthy we are as a community is incredible. It's something we use every day and take for granted. When we turn a knob or pull a handle, we expect water to be there. But there's a lot of work that goes into producing good quality water. We want people not to think about the water. We want them to think that every time they open the tap, it's going to be there, it's going to smell good, it's going to taste good, it's going to be wholesome. So one of our goals actually is to be taken for granted. Uh, and if we're being taken for granted, that's a good sign. 
You can learn more about the process at the Waterworks exhibit, which is on display at the Fraser Museum until May 1st. Each year, the Louisville Ballet season includes a choreographer's showcase, which highlights the work of local dancers and choreographers. Here's a look at what was involved in the creation of one of the unique ballets from one of their earlier showcases. One, two, three. I thought this would be a great opportunity to do something that meant something to me and to be able to share that with everybody else. So Pete, you can make your path a little bit smaller and go more directly yeah. there. Yeah. At the beginning, it was very, it was a little bit intimidating, and and um, but I have to say I was very lucky with the group of dancers that I that I worked with because they were all wonderful and and um, the people that I've known for a long time. So we all have a good sense of group and and uh, working together. I had had a lot of contact with young musician uh, Ben Soli, who's local as well. I've always enjoyed his work and his music. And so I thought, you know, this would also be a, a neat opportunity to take advantage of that. I came up with the, the scenes, the ideas, and as we got into the rehearsal process, I came up with movement phrases that, that helped depict what was happening, and he was brilliant about matching what was going on. I wanted to start with the movement so that it really informed the music and so that the music could support the movement in a more cohesive way. Because a lot of times I'll see a piece and the music's real nice and the dance is real nice, but when I see the leaps and everything, they don't really communicate to me what's happening with the music. You have to choose very consciously how much movement you're putting into the music or how much movement you're not putting into the music, and finding that really nice balance between letting the dance move itself and the music supporting that, but also when it's time, using the music to make the dance move more than it would have moved otherwise. Literally, it was just bits built from beginning to end, just piece by piece by piece by piece. So it was interesting. The challenge is chicken or the egg, because she's trying to choreograph the piece and then trying to write music. So we're, we're finding ourselves going back and forth and she's showing me a little footage. I'm showing her a little music and we're just sort of tweaking, tweaking it as it comes together. Maybe if we had like a five, six, seven, eight or a five, seven, and then start. Bom. There's three main characters in Mikhail's ballet. There's the grandmother and then there's the mother and then there's the, the granddaughter. So you've got three different generations there and they're you know, all interacting with each other. So it seemed like it, it made sense to have three instruments. And so we composed for cello, violin, and clarinet. I tried to take from conversation, you know, the way we talk in families. We don't always finish our sentences. Our families finish our sentences for us. And then when we all agree on something, we all agree on it and talk over each other. And so I tried to incorporate that into the music. My grandparents had recently died, um, so this was something that was very uh, prevalent in my mind, and so I wanted to pay tribute to them, and uh, this is where the inspiration came from. At times it was difficult for me because it was such a, a close concept, something that was very close to my heart.
so there were times that I would get very wrapped up in the in the sadness of it, um, but on the other hand, I would get very wrapped up in the happy part of it too, which made it really um, a lot of fun. That's all for this Metro Edition. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember, stay connected to your city, your life, and your Louisville right here on the national award-winning Metro TV. Until next time, I'm Matt Schuster. Make it a great day. Metro TV a public service of Louisville Metro Government.